All right, welcome everyone to GraphQL FM once again. Um, happy Tuesday. Tony, how are you doing? Doing pretty well. Uh, the air is clearing up here in San Francisco, so pretty happy about that. Um, yeah, can't complain. Super excited to, uh, to chat with our guests. That's great. Um, before we start, a small announcement. Uh, so we got the GraphQL FM as a podcast now. So I think it's getting distributed to all podcast players at the moment. So uh, if you want to watch it, uh, if you don't want to watch it live and don't want to watch a video, I know a lot of people were asking for a podcast. It should be there now. So all new episodes going to be published there. Um, so yeah, this week we've got a very special guest. We've got uh, Eric Vitrin with us today. Uh, Eric, how are you doing? I'm very well. Thanks. Do you want to tell uh, everybody a bit uh, what, what you're doing? Uh, you're at IBM, yeah. right? Yes, I'm at IBM. I've been at IBM for six years. Um, the first five years that I was at IBM, I, I spent in New York um, at the IBM Research Lab in upstate New York and was doing research in the area of software engineering around APIs, first starting with like HTTP or REST or REST-like APIs, and then eventually switching to doing research on GraphQL. And then about a year ago, my wife and I decided to move to Germany. And um, I took that move as an opportunity also to switch teams. So I switched from the research side into the product side. And for one year now, I've been helping the um, API Connect Data Power product team to um, build GraphQL support into their product based on the research, basically, that I did before. Nice. I'm actually curious, uh, maybe before we start, how mm -hmm. how do you get into the research track? Because it's not something I've heard very much of being in the like practical software engineering side of the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, typically, um, if you want to work for IBM Research, or I think the same is true for Microsoft Research or Google Research, um, they want you to to have like a, a PhD. Um, so for me, the way that things went is I studied at university and didn't really know what to do afterwards. But my master thesis basically led to my su supervisors asking me, you know, do I want to do a PhD? So I said yes, had nothing better to do basically, <laughs> and, and, and did that for four years. And um, uh, especially in the US, it's actually very common if you do a PhD in computer science that you do some kind of like summer internships with the research, uh, research lab. And, um, and you might spend a few months basically doing industrial research, maybe trying to write a research paper at the end of it. Um, and I did that as well uh, at IBM Research. And when I, when I came to the completion of my PhD, they basically asked me to interview with them and, and, and I did and I got a position out of it. So, so I think typically you, you do a PhD and, and then you can get um, um, a research position either as a postdoc, um, that's typically like a temporary position for a few years, or as a staff member where it's basically an unlimited position. Mm -hmm. So I think your your group, Eric, at IBM has um, three papers we were saying before, um, at mm -hmm. least about GraphQL. And uh, the first one you did yeah. is called an, an empirical study of GraphQL schemas. Um, and I thought it might be like a good um, prelude to everything else. Um, so this paper kind of looked at a bunch of publicly available GraphQL schemas, is that right? Yeah, yeah. We, we looked at like two data sets. On the one hand, um, we basically tr wanted to see, uh, so I mean, the main idea we had that research was really to, uh, to get a better understanding how GraphQL is used um, in, in the wild. And um, so, so we looked at two data sets. The so one was, um, schemas from like commercial GraphQL APIs. And there's a, there's a repository on GitHub called APIs Guru, and they maintain kind of a list of like publicly accessible um, GraphQL endpoints. And so we, we, um, we chose 16 of them where we could introspect the schema basically. And um, then the second data set was around like 8,000 schemas that we actually found using GitHub search, right, the, the code search. So we basically looked for SDL files. And we did a bunch of filtering and pre-processing to, you know, deduplicate them, to 
make sure that they are only valid ones. You know, we validated them basically and um, and did all, all kinds of steps and ended up with these like 8,000 schemas. And then we did some kind of analysis on them. So we wanted to know a few different things. We looked, for example, for the usage of different types of features, um, like how, how many of them do actually support like simple things like mutations or subscriptions, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and we wanted also to compare between the data sets, like do commercial GraphQL APIs differ from non-commercial ones? And we found that in some cases, you know, they really do. They, they tend to use, the commercial ones, for example, tend to use um, uh, more features. You know, they, they use interfaces and things like that, which a lot of the, the ones that we found on GitHub didn't. But it's a little bit hard to say because on GitHub, the variety of schemas that we found is huge, right? Um, often with these type of data, if you, if you collect data from GitHub, you have these power law distributions. And this was the case here as well, right? We had a a small number of schemas that were like very large and very extensive and very very advanced and then you have a long tail huge amount of schemas that are basically like toy examples um, we actually try to you know um, also account for that fact by dividing up the the github data set making basically a group of only the large schemas um, but we still found some differences with regards to to the usage of features um, naming conventions was a little bit um, less clear. You know, the naming convention being things like using Pascal case for type names, um, using all capital letters for enum values and these type of things. You know, some of these conventions are actually prescribed by GraphQL and some of them are kind of like have naturally evolved. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was, again, not 100% clear cut who uses what. And then, yeah, so so... I think it's interesting to do that, but it's also, it's not the type of result where you can easily say, you know, that's that's the way it is and that's not the way it is. It got a little bit clearer actually when we looked into um, into um, pagination and generally the um, ability to form like very ex um, ex expensive queries against these schemas. So we basically, the way that we looked at that was we, try to figure out, you know, how many um, lists, like fields that return lists, can you basically nest in a query, right? So if, if you write a query and there's basically none of the fields returns any lists, um, if, if that's all you can do with a given schema, right, then the size of the query basically as it grows, so does the size of the response because every, every response data needs to be named in that query, right? Mm -hmm. But as soon as you start having fields that return lists, suddenly the size of the response can be magnitudes higher than the size of the query that you sent, right? And, and the more nested lists you can basically do, the higher the polynomial um, of that relationship. And then if you can actually do queries where, you know, you have a, a field returns a list and then within there or indirectly within there, you can select that same field or the same type of field again, right? Then you can basically come to a case where the size of the response grows exponentially in the size of the query. And we basically tried to see, you know, how many of these schemas um, allow these types of queries. And the commercial schemas, basically, nearly all of them basically allow these type of queries. So this was a little bit also a motivation for what we're going to talk about later, right, which is the cost analysis, because it kind of led us to believe that, you know, a lot of these GraphQL endpoints, you know, you, they, they could potentially receive queries that could be really expensive either to execute for the backend or they could even be potentially, you know, um, breaking or leading to a denial of service or something off the backend. Yeah, that's for, that's probably yeah. the, the perfect segue for, for what we uh, we want to dive into today. Uh, so that led to your latest paper, uh, which is called A Principled Approach to GraphQL Query Cost Analysis, um, mm -hmm. which, uh, by the way, you got a prize for, I think. So congratulations. Yeah. That's congratulations. That's Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, Tony and I read that paper uh, last week. And um, so, as you know, because uh, GitHub's API is uh, featured in some ways uh, in, in that paper mm -hmm. through the research. So, and I've worked on our query cost analysis at GitHub for our GraphQL API. So this is kind of a subject I'm super interested in. So as you said, the, um, certain schemas allow for the relationship between the query size and response size uh, with list types gets like, can get quite crazy. Um, so mm -hmm. 
I guess what I want to dive into is um, kind of like what I have, what is the what have you noticed in all the APIs you look through in the research uh, in terms of um, what's the biggest risk out there? Would you say like this the unbounded list type is the what allowed you to form like the biggest responses? Um, yeah, I think so. I think um, I mean typically what. APIs that you know, especially ones that are exposed to the to the public, like like GitHub's is right. I mean, you try to have mechanisms in place to um, to limit that, right? Either um, the backend implements certain limits on the number of items that are going to get returned, or you put in some kind of like um, pagination mechanism, right? And in GraphQL, that's typically just some some slicing argument, like give me users and then you say limit and then you give a number and it tells you that's the maximum amount of users that you're going to get back or it's um, the relay spec for our cursor connections, right? Where it's basically um, pagination on steroids, right? It, it, it doesn't give you back immediately a list, but you get back a connection which has a bunch of utility um, like, like a cursor that you can then use to, to paginate further pages um, even in light of, of updates of the list at the same time, and um, it, it can tell you the overall size of the list. So obviously, um, you know, basically the, the more, the better and more used the GraphQL API, I think the, the more built out are these type of mechanisms anyhow. Um, but I think looking at the, at the schemas that we mined, and also at some commercial ones, right, we still found a lot of cases where no such mechanisms are in place. And it's really, it's at least unclear. There's probably something implemented that delimits how much data is coming back, but it's a little bit unclear um, um, how much is. And um, and I think the cost analysis, right? I mean, one of the first things that it, that it ideally gives you is some kind of, you know, insight into what could be, you know, the expense of a query that, that I'm doing. So it gives you some kind of of transparency right that makes a lot of sense and there's so many little details i want to ask you about but i think i just realized maybe mm -hmm. we can talk about what cost analysis is uh in the first place and why we mm -hmm. use it so i think um i think we talked about that with scott from shopify uh a few episodes um where briefly yeah right. when you want to rate limit a graphql api and when you want to rate limits apis in general um not all queries or endpoints are created equal and for a typical okay. HTTP API, usually that never it rarely gets to the point where you need to like give a cost to each individual endpoints. Although a lot of people end up there, um, but with GraphQL, it's the difference between queries is so large that you need to find a way to say this query is that expensive and that other one is actually very easy to execute. So um, that leads mm -hmm. a lot of us. Um, Shopify does it. GitHub does it try to give a cost to queries to basically uh -huh. be able to parse a query before we execute it and say, oh, actually, this one is going to be way too expensive, uh, so we're going to block it right away, or using that cost as the way we rate limit API. So if you look at GitHub's API, um, most people have 5,000 points per hour, um, and every query has a certain amount of points attached to it. So if you're making queries with let's say a hundred points, um, you have just very few of those. If you have queries that are only worth one, you can do 5,000 of them in an hour. So your paper, Eric, kind of gives a formal approach on how to cost a GraphQL query. Is that right? Yeah, 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 I think that's true. Um, I want to say though that um, you immediately focus also on the part that I'm also most interested in, which is kind of like a static analysis approach. Mm -hmm. There's also, I would still call that a cost analysis, but a dynamic approach, right? Which is a little bit on the other side of the spectrum where, um, as you said, right, you, you want to know the cost ideally upfront before you start start even executing that query. But you, you could also start executing that query and then as you invoke resolver functions, right, you might sum up a, a cost value. Yeah. And if it hits a certain limit, right, at that point, you, you might abort or, or you could time out which is also more of a dynamic approach. Um, and there's actually hybrid approaches where you kind of, you look at this, the query statically, and then you actually, um, while you do so, you might actually probe the backend for the sizes of lists, for example. That's actually, um, there's, there's 
like scientific precedence to our paper. There, there used to be a paper from 2018, or there is a paper from 2018 that also covers this, this topic, and they have this kind of hybrid approach where they go through the query before it's being executed, but while they do so, they actually have to probe the backend for mm. certain sizes of lists, right, to, to get an accurate right. um, cost figure. Um, we, we went the static route because um, we basically had like a specific use case for the cost analysis in mind. We wanted, like this is the IBM hat, right? Uh, we were interested in seeing could we use an analysis like that in an API management product like API Connect or Data Power, right? And, and so we didn't want to have any um, requirements on the GraphQL backend except that it's just a GraphQL backend. We didn't want to require it to have like a specific endpoint that we could ask for the size of a certain list or something like that. Because typically a GraphQL backend doesn't have something like that. And we didn't want to, to ask the owner of the backend to basically have to provide that for, for things to work. So we look really at the, at the static side of things. And yes, our paper then basically tried to basically formalize um, um, what that means, basically formalize the GraphQL language in a way that we could then reason about it and given certain assumptions basically um, conclude or like prove logically um, prove that, you know, um, under these assumptions, um, the size or the, the cost that we're going to determine when looking at a query is actually always going to be an upper bound about the, uh, of the actual cost, right? Mm -hmm. And that's an important aspect because one thing that is not ideal about static analysis is that you might overestimate the actual cost, right? And there's typically two main reasons for that. One is that some fields are nullable and they're going to return, you know, you're trying to, to execute that field and maybe it has a bunch of subselections, but it actually it re the resolver returns oh, none, right? True. And so mm -hmm. a, a part of that query might never actually get executed on the back end. And the amount of data that is going to come back from the back end might actually be, be smaller than what you'd expect. And the second reason that we typically see for, for overestimation of cost is that um, we basically have to assume the size of lists that fields return. And we can we, we typically do so either by um, assuming a static size, like we say, okay, this this field, it returns a list and that list is always going to be of length 10, let's say. Or we do it by basically um, teaching our, or telling our static analysis to look for, for slicing arguments and taking their values from the query. So if again, we go for like users limit 10, in that case, the static analysis would take the value 10 and basically then assume that the list that comes back is of length 10. But in reality, right, once that resolver runs on the back end, what might happen is there's only five users in, in the system and then you have um, you have overestimated the, the cost. Right. I, and I this resonates so much because that um, that's the reason. Uh, so GitHub's API uses those the relay pagination arguments to do the static mm -hmm. analysis. And that's something we've been we've thought about before where when people say, I want the 101st, uh, pro, uh, 101st repos, for example, well, you don't know if that yeah. organization is going to have 100 repos or only one, but in either case, yeah. they're going to be cost, as you said, like at the upper bound. And this is this can be problematic on kind of like both ends, like either you rate limit too much or mm -hmm. just like not enough for how much data gets uh, loaded. And something we, we thought about is some kind of some kind of like refund system where maybe we cost you the upper bound, but if you didn't request, uh, we kind of like refund you after or something. But then I think, and you were talking about like static analysis or kind of like the more runtime analysis. And I think the beauty of the static analysis, if you can do it, is that um, users can can know the cost of a query. Like it's, it's kind of a constant across different uh, users, organizations, mm -hmm. especially if I, you think of like multi-tenant applications like Shopify, it's kind of confusing if one of your shops, for example, is like so much more expensive to consume through the API. And then the other yeah. one, which has less products, for example, you can make more calls, but it's this often the same mm -hmm. code base that queries both. So it's, um, th yeah, it's such a tricky problem. Yeah. I think that's a tricky problem, and I fear that I don't have a really good answer. Um, what what we are doing at IBM and the product is also this, we call it replenish, 
we basically, when the query comes in, we estimate the upper bound of the cost, um, and then we execute the query, and then we we actually statically analyze the response, and we look, you know, what what was the actual cost, and that value should be right. smaller than what we predicted, and the difference is going to get replenished to your rate limit. So what this leaves you with is that as a client, right? there might be a certain time interval while while the query is executing where your remaining rate limits are actually lower than they should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think we we hope that that's a reasonable price to pay. Um, I mean, right, I mean, I mean, it's definitely um, a trade off. But but the reason that people are interested in cost analysis, right, is because without it, there, there could be misuse. And as you said before, just looking at the number of requests coming in is just not sufficient with GraphQL. And, and so the risk associated with that uh, for us or also in my opinion outweigh the potential that you know temporarily you might be overcharged basically. Right, yeah, that makes absolute sense. Huh. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could talk a little bit about, about how the, the cost is calculated in the paper. Um, yeah. There's a there's two complexities proposed, if I understand correctly, a yeah. ty type complexity and a resolver complexity. Can you tell us a little yeah. bit about like what, what those are and what the difference is between the two? Yeah. So um, they basically, so the type complexity basically tries to reflect um, the amount of data that a query is likely to return at, at most. Okay. Whereas the um, re resolver complexity is about the um, the um, amount of resolver functions that are going to get invoked in the backend. Okay. Um, in IBM's product, actually, we have renamed them. We have we call them type, cost, and field cost. Okay. And we we call it field cost instead of resolver cost because we wanted, you know, the target of that number is typically the end user, like the client who makes the call, and the client doesn't necessarily think when they think about GraphQL, they don't necessarily think about resolvers, right? They more think about fields. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, right, why do you need two figures? And and I think one answer would be that, um, imagine again this query of like um, users limit 10, right? And then maybe the name, right? So um, the, there's basically one field invoked, right? The users field. And let's say we ignore the name field because it returns a scalar string, right? And it's probably not actually going to cause any cost on the back end, right? Once you fetch the 10 users, you know, the name is basically for free. Mm -hmm. So the, the field cost of that query would be one, right? And um, if you now increase 10 by like a big factor, right? You make it a thousand, right? And suddenly the field cost is still one, right? Because you're basically just invoking one field, but the amount of data that's coming back suddenly is a thousand users, right? Mm -hmm. So you somehow want to acknowledge that as well. And that's why we basically introduce the type cost in addition to the field cost, right? Um, we think that both numbers um, are valuable when, you know, as an API provider, you want to form certain policies around rate limiting or threat prevention. Bo both numbers can be relevant for you. Um, how exactly you use them, that, that's up to you. And actually, the way that, that in our cost analysis um, and also described in the paper, right, you can basically, you can assign weights to, um, to different types or different fields. So you may know, for example, that the invocation of a certain field is free or on the other end of the spectrum, maybe it's it's you know it's much more expensive than all the other fields that you typically try to resolve. So you can numerically try to to model that relationship, which is really I mean it's very um, dependent on your specific implementation of your GraphQL backend, how you want to do that. But uh, I think a, a good cost analysis basically allows you to do that. And having that in mind, these cost figures, right? What they ultimately are are weighted sums. So the field costs are the weighted sum of the field invocations of a query. And the type cost is the weighted sum of the um, values of, of different types that a query returns. Yeah, yeah the, the distinction between both, I think, is super important. When I first read the paper, um, I was more looking towards, I think um, the field uh, cost is called resolve cost as well, or are these the same? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, they're okay. the same, yeah, sorry. Um, to me, I, I'm mainly worried day to day the, uh, the resolve cost usually um, because we see more issues with underlying load on the system of a query rather than the serializing load of a, of our large payload, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And yep. it's, do you have any advice on how people can assign a cost to something? Is this trial and trial and or error, or is it 
can you look at certain metrics? As you said, I'm guessing it depends a lot on your underlying system, um, but I find that's a, uh, that's one of the hard parts. Um, I think I would try to use at like traces of the system, you know, what, what are expensive invocations? I mean, I can imagine that often enough, you know, it comes down to, to, you know, executing maybe expensive queries in a database uh, and, and you couldn't look at those and, and take that as a measure. Um, it might in other cases be even more obvious. So for example, imagine you have a resolver function that actually makes some kind of external request to some other API. And you may actually, you know, as the GraphQL backend provider, you may actually be the customer of that other API and you may be paying for requests, right? You have your own rate limits or your paid plan or yeah. something, right? Maybe you're integrating with, with Stripe and you do some payment processing or something, right? Or looking up payment numbers. Mm. And, and then, you know, it, it, there's, it's easier to, um, to, to, to think of, you know, a monetary value that you want to assign with that. Um, I think that's still probably very generic advice. Sorry, but uh, <laughs> no, it's yeah, that's GraphQL. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it depends so much on how you you build things. I think yeah. one thing that was tempting to me sometimes is um, using the response time or the resolver time to kind of derive a cost. But I think the, one of the problems with that is that the the time a resolver takes to execute um, also depends a lot on context and the current state of the system yeah. so it, it seems that seems like a data science problem possibly as well but it does i mean i could imagine that you know you have a resolver that is actually very fast but it's only fast because you already have some kind of redis in memory you know right. database on the back end that's actually pretty expensive right so the the time is little but actually it's only little because you're already like spending a lot of money on it and so that might not be sufficient right and there's like um so i think you yeah you have to really look at the larger architecture of of, of how things are implemented I, I yeah feel. that makes sense um chris roadie 74 in chat is asking how do you calculate this when you use a data loader when resolving fields um mm -hmm. yeah i think that's a good question um i i don't think i have an immediately good answer for it i think you would the places where you would use the data loader, you would you would try to basically reduce the cost for those fields. Maybe you would try to to give it a mean, you know, between the the cost that you would apply if you didn't have a data loader, and the cost that you now, the the lower cost that now you can apply because you have a data loader. I mean, a data loader is great, right? But it's also not free, right? I mean, in order to run the data loader, you know, it does keep stuff in memory. So yeah. ultimately, there is going to be some type of cost associated with it, and and again, it's a, um, I think it's up to you to to model that um, correspondingly. Yeah, the data loader it, one is tricky, even for uh, monitoring. I've talked about this before, but um, when you monitor a resolver timing, if it's using a data loader, mm -hmm. it might run super fast, but it's enqueuing something to be loaded later that's going to be really slow. Mm -hmm. And then if, like, let's yep. say five fields are using the, the same data loader it's not really true that it's divided by five. Like it's the relationship yeah. between enqueuing something to be loaded mm -hmm. and the load time is like, is really yeah. hard. And it's the same for complexity, I guess. It's like, it's hard to tell. Yeah, yeah. it's a good question. Or, or it could but, be, it could be expensive on the first lookup when you fire off a batch and then very cheap every other one since you already have it in memory. Um, yeah. It, my, my assumption would be that actually, you know, with this type of configuration, I mean, so the cost analysis that we presented, it gives you the means to fine tune all of these. I think if you were to use it, right, and if you wanted to make use of all, all the knobs that you have to, to really configure it, I think you would probably want to observe actual traffic for a while. And you would want to use that to inform how you actually fine tune it. Yeah. Um, there, and, and obviously, you know, there's potential for assisting you to do that right i mean there could be certain types of analysis that you can basically get out of the box in association with the cost analysis like that that basically propose to you how to do certain things mm. um, this is a little bit in line you know with with some of the things that we did in in the product work where we took this cost analysis and, and one of the things that that is required to use it is actually some type of configuration and the reason is that in graphql things like the slicing arguments right they are there, there's conventions around them, but these conventions don't have to hold true, right? In the relay, um, 
um, pattern, you know, um, cursor connections, you typically the slicing arguments are called first and last. Um, so, I mean, if, if you follow that, um, that spec, then you will call them like that, but you could give them any name you want, right? And the GraphQL language itself has no means of differentiating that. So in order for our customers to work, you basically have to, to tell it these type of things, right? You have to tell it that an argument with a numeric value of type int that's called first, you know, that's actually um, a slicing argument. So please use it to estimate the, the length of lists, right? And, and so this type of configuration is something that, that the API provider has to give, has to do for the cost analysis to properly work. And then the product, the way that we try to mitigate these efforts that, that exist around that is that we have some kind of UI that shows you the schema in a tabular view. And it gives you some kinds of recommendations for configuration. So we can statically look at the schema and we can see that, you know, uh, going back to the stupid example, but you have a query type and it has a field users and it returns a list of user objects, right? So we can look at that and if there's no, uh, um, if there's no configuration associated with that yet, then we could basically tell the user, you know, there's, there's this field and it returns a list of users and without configuration, we don't know how long that list is. But there also happens to be a limit argument of type int. So we propose to you that, you know, you configure this to be the slicing argument for this field. Nice. And, and so this can really reduce the effort that you um, that you have to spend in order to configure things. That is really cool. So what happens if, um, I guess, is there a same default for list types with no slicing arguments? Or would you just like panic at that point and say like, I can't compute a cost for this. It's like infinite cost, you know, is, or. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if the configuration is really missing, we would actually say infinite and if we have to say infinite because that that's in line with our um, reasoning about, we always want to have the upper bound, right. right? So if we know the size, we are going the conservative route and we say upper bound and that would, I mean, in practice, that would mean that all queries that use a field where there's no configuration for the list size, they would basically if you have some kind of, of rate limiting or threat prevention policy defined, then all of these queries would be blocked. Right. Basically. Yeah. But we're trying to really avoid that. So, so that's, that goes back to the UI that I just talked about, right? right. When, when in, in this API management product, when, when you upload, when you introspect your backend, right, and it gets the schema, it, it tells you all of these places. And you can basically, one button, you can say accept all proposals. And at that point, you, you typically end up with a schema that is configured so that queries work normally as you would expect. It, that's a really interesting result to me that this uh, kind of cost analysis can be run and propose uh, almost like a better schema, like a safer schema for you, like yeah. a, like as a aid in, in schema design, which... Yeah, it doesn't impact though the structure of the schema, right? So the way, um, it, it basically just impacts the, the configuration around the analysis. But okay. I think you could, you could use so, so you, you could use it that way though. So for example, let's go back to the um, users field, right? Let's say there is no numeric argument called limit. There's just no argument on that field. It's just a field called users. It returns a list of users, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, all that we can do in the cost analysis is basically provide like a, um, a fixed size, right? We could basically ask the API um, provider to, to tell us what's, what's the number, right? How many, how many users are going to be in that list at, at most, right? But obviously, you know, often enough, that's that's not very good, right? Because that, I mean, that, that's a weird case. It could be true in, in some cases, but often enough, that's not what you want. Mm -hmm. And so you could basically, when when the static analysis of the schema detects that, it could basically tell the the API provider, look, this is maybe a place where you want to consider adding um, a slicing argument to your schema and implement that. Yeah, and it's probably good advice to people building GraphQL schemas to be consistent in the first place before even yeah. using that tool and like using yeah. similar pagination yeah. arguments everywhere. And that's just going to make, <laughs> make it easier after, but yeah, it's, it's good yeah. practice for sure. Yeah. Coming back to our uh, empirical research paper, right? Um, we found that these pagination mechanisms are used extremely inconsistently. I mean, um, I, I mean, that's not necessarily bad, right? Many APIs actually mi mix like slicing, si simple slicing arguments. In, in some places in the schema with like um, cursor connections in other places of the schema. And I think that's fine. But mm -hmm. it, it also tells you something about, you know, that 
that you know in, in some cases maybe the um, cursor connections is a little bit of overkill, right? Yeah. I, I assume that's something what the schema designer then has in mind. Or, and and so unfortunately the reality, you know, this it's it's complicated, right? There's a lot of different things people do. Yeah, it's um, it's I'm I'm surprised there's um. So for the pagination, it seems like there's there, the relay connection is. My assumption would be that it's the most used, but is is this something uh -huh. you could see in your paper or? Yeah, yeah. And the commercial APIs, I think like sixty percent of them or something use the relay connections. So, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's I, I I think that's true. I think when it comes to you know, on GitHub again, right? A lot of the schemas we looked at are probably like um, tutorial schemas or like toy examples, right. right? And and they typically don't use cursor connections I think um, rightly so right because I think I mean typically when you know when I when I um, when I sometimes talk with people about GraphQL that don't know GraphQL yet right and I show them a query like a lot of things immediately click if you show them cursor connections sometimes it's a little bit less so right it needs right. a little bit more context like why do you do this why do you have these indirections what is it good for you have connections and edges right like two basically like kind of like virtual yeah. types like why is that really needed so there's a there's a bunch of explanation that needs to be done before that clicks i think no that makes sense it's the the relay connection pattern is like more than one thing which makes it more confusing sometimes for people because like it it's cursor based mm -hmm. pagination which is already a thing that's different from uh you may be doing already and then there's the end direction as you said like the connection object and the edge object but in theory, you could be using yep. connection object and edge objects with like limits based pagination, or you could yeah, be... you could or, or offsets. Right. I mean, yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, you could you could just use you know the the connection to just give you the page info or something like that. Right. So, yeah. There's different ways you could you could spend this. Um, but I think I mean Relay did put out um, a spec, and um, as as an implementer of GraphQL tooling. I'm obviously happy about <laughs> yeah. that because it kind of gives me, you know, whenever I get into like some debate or something, I can always say, well, but look at the spec, right? It says yeah. that's the way to do it. And, and then <laughs> that typically helps. Yeah, definitely. If yeah. you, I think internally within an API, it's super important to be consistent, but then you can pick whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing since real is a specification is kind of, it allows you to be consistent externally with other APIs as well, which is nice. Yeah. So it's, it's always nice to see people using something that's specified, but of course not everybody can do cursor based pagination or everything. So yeah, there's, yeah. there's a lot of places where we, where we take the API and really use it as a gateway and just hide the fact that we don't have cursors in whatever data store that we're, <laughs> that we're using. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll fake it, but, um, yeah, I, I just want to plug, uh, for the, for the spec, like it's, it's really flexible. I, I've not previously seen like that good of a pagination specification and mm -hmm. maybe there's like, exists another one that's great but that allows you to do like forwards pagination backwards pagination um, pagination in the middle of a list yeah. whatever yeah yeah i agree i think it's it's really good um i think the the graphql ecosystem definitely benefits from it yeah tony do you um do you use anything like query complexity analysis because for us being a public api it's I guess I see it as kind of a must. A must. Yeah. Um, what about yeah. like an, an internal API? Yeah. So we have an internal API in, um, when we first started looking at like, how do we prevent crazy stuff from happening? Um, it became very clear that it, it was a hard problem to figure out how to cost out the query. Like we, we, our API talks with a lot of different services and even the cost of calling that service can change over time depending on the performance of that service and how it's interacting with its dependencies. Um, so we punted on it. And, and what we did, in, in fact, is kind of took that dynamic approach Eric mentioned earlier uh, in just setting timeouts uh, like very tightly. Um, so it's kind of like we don't ever avoid execution of something that won't finish in time, but we also don't have to think extremely hard about it. Like we know during normal operation, this thing takes this amount of time and you only get that amount of time to finish. Um, so it, it's not as yeah. nice, but, um, I could see us taking a formal approach like this and kind of retrofitting it into that system where maybe we, um, maybe we feed that static analysis configuration with our execution data to provide 
weights or something like that. Um, we have a pretty large API with many thousands types in fields. Um, so it would be kind of a task to weight everything, um, but maybe not so bad if we can do it from our actual execution data. Yeah, interesting. I mean, one, one thing to note, though, is with the configuration, right? We, we have some defaults that we believe are sensible, which is okay. that um, fields that return scalars or enum types, we basically weigh them with zero okay. because we assume that typically they are contained in the parent, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. um, objects and interfaces um, and unions, fields that return those, they typically, we weigh them with one, right? Mm -hmm. And so this, in, in many cases, this already leads to kind of the results that you would expect. Okay. Right. Uh, at least it, it gives you, you know, if, if I see a query and I, I can basically, often I can, you know, hand go through the query and basically sum up and multiply the things and basically tell you what number um, would, would result for it. And, and so the defaults are there. So you could apply a cost analysis like this without applying weights. Interesting. And that, yeah, that actually, I mean, and, and you actually make, make a few things simpler by doing that way. So, so there, there are a few things that the paper actually doesn't even go into enough detail, I feel, um, which um, you're going to encounter when you start really implementing it. And one of the things is dealing with abstract types. So imagine you have an interface, right? An interface called, I mean, they are typically called node, but let's use pet and you have a, a, a concrete types like cat and dog and you assign different um, weights to them, right? You, um, the cat has a, has a type weight of, um, of two and the dog has a type weight of three. And now you, the query goes for a field that returns um, a, a pet, right? So now what is, what is the impact on the cost of that field? Mm -hmm. and the answer that we came up with is basically it has to be the maximum mm -hmm. of all the concrete types, right? So it has to be three in this case because we don't know yet from just looking at the query what's it going to turn out to be at runtime. Yeah. And so in order to produce the upper bound, we have to go with the maximum value. Um, and, and, and we have to, so we have to do this because we won't know and, and we allow different weights. So if we wouldn't allow different weights, we could just use one, right? Right, And then this is also interesting for replenishing data because now the response comes back. So now the question is, what actually happened in the execution? Did the thing turn out to be a cat or did it turn out to be a dog? Right. Now, if we're lucky, right, the query went within pet, it, it went for underscore underscore type name. If that's the case, then we immediately know, oh, this is a dog or oh, this is a cat. If it didn't, you know, we can basically try to infer the actual type from a structural analysis. So we basically look at, we look at the fields that were selected and which ones were null and which ones weren't. And then we can basically try to deduce what the type was at runtime. Mm. But there are cases where that doesn't work, of course. And in that case, we cannot really replenish. We still have to assume it's, it was a dog, it, it costs three. And so we basically cannot replenish properly, even if that thing happened to be um, a cat. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, so there is additional complication in allowing these different weights. Yeah, that's funny. We, hmm. That's exactly how we handle it as well. Uh, we take the upper okay, bound yeah. of all possibilities, except we don't have the replenish thing. Um, and it's actually the yeah. same thing for um, scalar types and enums don't cost, uh, don't mm -hmm. have a cost. And yeah. it, I find like they're the great heuristics. They're like most mostly right um, most of the mm -hmm. time. Um, but the replenish idea, I think, is where you push it even further, uh, which is really, really cool to hear about, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but right by choosing to allowing different weights, I mean, it's um, it initially sounds great, but then again, you're introducing complexity that, I mean, complexity in terms of like implementation effort and right you know, undecidability in some cases, which introduces new challenges. So yeah, it's a, it's a trade-off, I think. Yeah. I think the, the only other kind of heuristic we have is that um, for root fields that are connections, um, so let's say you're fetching a list of things on the root and say you want the 100 first ones, mm -hmm. um, that initial query costs only one, not 100, because knowing our system, we know that's going to be one query to fetch a hundred things. Um, and then yeah. everything querying, um, below that is going to be, 
uh, kind of effect to a hundred. Exactly. Yep. Um, so yeah. is that something yeah, you do as well, or you kind of does a hundred? Yeah, yeah, that's what we. Yeah, that's what we do as well with the um, field, aka resolver right. cost, right? Um, we basically would say, yeah, that initial field, it's basically one database lookup, but it happens to return 100 things. And then if we select something within that we have to apply cost for, then that cost is multiplied by 100. And so, yeah, so basically, I mean, in general, right, the way that it works is you 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 go through the query and you basically, you have this um, multiplication factors that you basically, they multiply with one another. If you have nested, selections for things with 100 and 100 you know you, you end up at 10,000 suddenly and, and and so that I, I think that's probably similar to the way that github does it and I think also the way that Shopify does it from reading their documentation on how they do rate limiting um, again this there's complications in this right especially when it comes to usage of fragments for example um, because when you have a fragment, then, you know, you may be at a certain point, you know, in a certain nesting level with a certain factor. And now you basically want to jump into that fragment and analyze that fragment and, right. um, right to account for it properly because the, the cost of that fragment per se, then needs to be multiplied with your current factor. And, and so there, again, it becomes a little bit more complicated. So I think there's a few cases where, um, where, where, you know, it, it took a while for us to get the implementation right. Um, and, and that's actually our reasoning, right? We basically said, well, look, um, there, are, there are things where, where it's not trivial. And so it's, cost analysis is probably a good place to put into like a separate API management layer because then API to implement it themselves, they can basically just use use it from an existing product. Obviously, I mean, that really depends who you are, right? If, if you are a large organization like GitHub and um, you, you, ha you have really good engineers working on your GraphQL API and it's the next version of your API, then I think you can afford to do the cost analysis yourself. Um, yeah. But, but I, we, I assume that there's a lot of other companies that, that are glad that, you know, that somebody um, did that for them for sure it's Lisa. it's not a trivial thing to implement right it's uh no and not something not at all something you really want to get right usually uh especially when it comes to if you're if you have a public api especially um yeah tony we're talking about uh timeouts and i think yep. to me one of the most interesting thing would is finding the relationship between cost and time to me has been like yeah. a very interesting question so Sometimes you'll hit um, an API and the cost, you're going to be within the bounds of the permitted cost for a query, but then you'll get a timeout. Mm -hmm. That that happens uh, with the GitHub API sometimes. And finding mm -hmm. exactly the relationship, basically the maximum cost before you get a timeout would be ideal. Yeah. But it's it, Interesting. it doesn't work, I guess. And the key here is finding the right weights for your fields, I guess, um, yeah. if you get that right it should be good. Um, but I find that's, to me, that's the, the next step is like, how does a company find the right, right costs to everything? Seems so hard. Um, I, I kind of like that the, the approach is to find the upper bound and at least you'll know it's never worse than that. Um, you yeah. can probably get better, tighter upper bounds. I wonder, I don't, maybe Eric, you may have an opinion on this. If there's like diminishing returns there beyond like this can, this could probably be improved. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess we also get into that trade-off that you talked about. Like now we have this additional complexity of setting maybe individual weights or something to get the tighter bound. Um, yeah. do you think I, I'd be curious to get your, your thoughts? Like, is, is this something that you think is, um, uh, a worthy problem to tackle or should, you know, just, yeah, I th so in part, you may be able to address it by changing your configuration, you know, to get better. Um, what we also observe, observe in the experiments that we do in the paper, right? So in, in the paper, we did a bunch of experiments against two APIs, GitHub and Yelp. Mm -hmm. And we basically, we randomly generated queries of different sizes um, based on the schema. Okay. Um, they just, you know, have like, a, they flip a coin per field and say, do I pick this field? Yes or no. Uh, do I go nesting down? Yes or no, right? And, and so we get a bunch of, of very diverse queries. And 
um, we basically we executed them um, o- o- over quite an interval of time. And so we were able to basically look at the cost that our analysis predicts and the actual cost by analyzing the response. And so we were basically able to map that relationship. And what's really, really obvious is that with increasing query size, like the prediction, the accuracy of our prediction gets worse. And that's to be expected because Mm -hmm. the more fields that you select, the more nesting you put into the query, you know, um, the more you're going to get hit by cases where the underlying data graph is actually sparser than what you would expect, right? If you are like five levels down nesting lists of 100 entries each, you know, chances are that at level two, you know, that list actually is only like 30, 30 entries long. And then, you know, that cascades, right? That error cascades to all the lower nestings. Uh, and so, so I think, to, to your question, Tony, I think it um, that depends a little bit on the type of queries that you're you're expecting. So um, I mean, you mentioned that I mean your API is internal so far, right? Yeah. So maybe I don't know if that's true, but I could imagine that that gives you a little bit more predictability about the the queries that, that are being performed. Like I could imagine that a public API, you know, there's there's researchers, you know, who do crazy queries to figure out, you know, where's the breaking point or stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe that's not so much the case for you. So, um, so, so I think that's, that's going to be an important factor. Well, what are the types of queries? Yeah. I would say yeah, that's one benefit we have is by volume, the amount of queries that we get are, are um, not that many uh, because they're all clients that are under our, con- our control, like our, uh, and, and they're incentivized to, to be fast, to be low latency for the best user experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, are, are the queries like very? I mean, are, are they very diverse? So, because I mean, I can also imagine that an application developer, right? They are they may be using GraphQL to figure out exactly what data they want, you know, and then they maybe derive some typing information from it in TypeScript yeah. or something, right? And then, and then they basically hard code that that query into their their application code and yeah. then it's going to stay fixed for a few months at least until yeah. maybe there's some new feature in that application and the query changes so i could imagine that the queries that you get are relatively homogeneous over yes. at least certain periods of time and then they change again that's yeah. right yeah and I, and i would imagine that on, on github's case right it's it's much more diverse probably because you know people come in with you know they probably also use the graphql explorer that you offer right and and, and they try out all, all kinds of different stuff, and you probably have a, a huge heterogeneity of, of queries. Definitely, and I'm I'm guessing I don't actually know that there's probably kind of a long tail again, like probably some very frequent mm-hmm. queries yeah. from our biggest integrators, and then a long tail of very different queries. Um, yeah. Would you say like was a lot of people are focused on query death, like how many levels? Um, mm-hmm. It seems like something I've discovered lately, and seems to be validated by. Uh, the paper actually is that death is 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 part of the cost, but it's not. You can't just look at that yeah. variable because you can get to a high cost in many ways, right? Either. Yeah, yeah. They could be a very flat query, right? It just maybe initially it goes for a very long list, and then within that long list, right, it it, it does another expensive resolver, right? And that query has like a, a nesting level of two or three. Um, but it could still be extremely expensive, whereas, you know, you're going for a user and then you're going for the user's address and then you're going for the city and then you're going for the city's population or something. Right. And and that's deeply nested, but it's all just, you know, it, it was all just contained maybe in the original user object for some reason, you know. And, and that one is cheap, even though it's it's more deeply nested. Um, and, and so I think, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because um, a lot of the, there's a, a lot of open source tooling that, goes for nesting level. And I think nesting level, I mean, it's a, like a, a red herring, right? It's it, it looks nice. It's like, it's easy to calculate. And, um, and you know, the nesting, it, it kind of, it can give you this implication that every nesting basically adds another join in a database query. And and that could be true, but it doesn't have to be true. And so right. I, I feel it's not, the, it's not in itself, it's not the right thing to look at. It could be almost kind um, of a false security um, to some people. Yeah, it could be. Mm. It, it could be. You shouldn't rely on it. I mean, um, 
So in, in the IBM product, you can define policies um, around threat prevention that basically that look at nesting level. They could basically say, okay, if the query is nested more than 10, you know, just block it. But in the actual cost calculation, we actually, we don't even calculate it anymore. We, you know, once the query hits that threat prevention threshold and, and we calculate the cost, we actually don't care for the nesting anymore. Right, that makes sense. Um, you talked about uh, yeah. open source. Um, the paper looked at a few existing solutions yeah. uh, to calculate cost. Is there any tool, uh, if somebody's listening right now and says like, that's it, I need to static <laughs> analyze my queries. <laughs> is there a tool you would recommend? Uh, there's your product oh. you're working on. Um, is there yeah. something existing open source that's that's good? So the there's, there's many, many cost analysis in open source, and we actually looked only at a few. We looked at, we, we limited ourselves to JavaScript, to that ecosystem, because that's where we were writing our prototype in as well. Um, and the ones that we looked at, they, they, they didn't fare very well in the specific use cases that we analyzed in our evaluation. And the reason was, for example, that one of them basically um, couldn't deal with like slicing argument. You could only just statically tell the size of list. That's that that wasn't ideal, um, or they they couldn't deal with the connections pattern, right? Because in the connections pattern, the field that holds the slicing argument doesn't itself return mm -hmm. the list. And so, in order to actually account for that, you need to basically retain that information until you go into the edges field, right? And and then the length of that list of edges is going to be determined. So that's something that we didn't see the other tools do. And then um, some of them were also missing the ability to actually statically determine the size of a list. So if there's a field that doesn't have a slicing argument, they would always assume that, you know, there's, only, there's one thing coming back. But if it's a list, you know, then you, those libraries actually underestimate the cost. Uh, and so the, so the ones that we looked at, we didn't find one that would, you know, fulfill all of these requirements. So in our experiments, none of them basically um, worked as well as the analysis that we built. But um, again, right, we only looked at JavaScript. And I know that, for example, I think the there's a Scala implementation of GraphQL called Sangria. I think it comes with a custom analysis. I think the Ruby GraphQL package has um, a cost analysis. And and I I couldn't tell you if, if they support these types of features or not. So, unfortunately, I can't give you a, a clear recommendation. Yeah, I, I'm not certain if they um, they have for the Ruby one at least. I know there's a cost analysis, but I don't know if it's it defaults. I think you need to probably provide a configuration for um, here's the connection pattern you should use mm -hmm. the first and last yeah. argument. Um, that's probably something you need to. Use. Um, somebody in the comments says. Ariadne for GraphQL Python. They recently introduced a query cost validator. That's cool. I, yeah, I'm seeing more and more libraries um, yeah. providing those, which, yeah, for which sure. is nice. Yeah, I mean, it would be nice also, you know, as a community to maybe, um, you know, to maybe come around to like get some degree of consensus maybe around this, right? I mean, it would be fantastic if if we could agree, maybe even starting with terminology, right? Like what are the, what are the different measures that we want to get out of an analysis? And then maybe the next thing that would be even, even more fantastic would be, you know, can we agree on the configuration, right? What, what's required for configuration? Can we maybe somehow make that portable? Mm -hmm. um, that I think would be something that could, could really help because then across programming languages, you could have different implementations, but if they, like in the case of cursor connections, we are relying on the same, let's say, spec, right? Then you could basically, you have portability, right? You can take your SDL maybe and switch from your JavaScript to a Python implementation, and you would still get like predictable cost analysis. Uh, I think that that would be something that would be really cool. Yeah, that would be really cool. Do, do you think the, um, the, the paper contains enough information for someone today looking at it to kind of... Uh, build kind of a reference or open source implementation of the cost algorithm, or would they need more <laughs> more details? No, I think I think I think the paper I think the paper lays out some of the fundamental concepts. Um, at least, I mean that that's 
our and my point of view, right? Yep. Or, or that's my point of view specifically, I would say. Um, I think it lays off some fundamentals, but um, since we started working on the paper, right, I've been working on the product team and I've been um, implementing this in a more product ready sense. And, right. and I came across a lot of, of things that I think the paper doesn't still cover, uh, yet cover, right? Like I mentioned before, like dealing with abstract types, right? Um, mm. Doing the response analysis properly, inferring the, the concrete types in the response analysis. So there's a bunch of things that that paper doesn't cover yet, right? These scientific papers, they, I mean, you. So one of the the challenges with them is that um, there's there's often quite quite a it's quite a long process for them to to get published, right? It's better with with conferences than it is with journals. Mm -hmm. um, because journals it can take years to publish a paper, but even with conferences, right? You, we submit that paper like early this year, and, and then we wait months for reviews, and then we do some revisions on it. But uh, and you also have constraints in the space, the amount of pages that you can can write. Um, and, and so that this paper, right? I mean, if if I was to write that paper today again, right? I I I mean, I'm not saying this is a bad paper, but I would definitely I have other things that I would also want to discuss, and so maybe there's. Maybe there's there's going to be a follow up on it, or maybe we, maybe some blog post at some point or something like that. So I think I think there could be even more information. But again, right? I think um, already starting with the different types of of what we call complexity measures in in the paper, I think that's already a, a good starting point. Um, to maybe maybe there's a chance for the community to to um, yeah agree more on those things. Definitely, I think just um, how how these concepts are talked about and the, the, the putting a word on that type complexity and resolve complexity um, is, is golden. Um, I really hope uh, people watching this or people who are reading the paper will uh, put that into um, libraries or even kind of a specifications and for the configuration and everything. So what's the, um, the, the product you're working on? Is that available uh, right now? Can people look it up? Yeah. Yeah, it's available right now. Um, it's yeah. So the product is this API management solution by IBM, and um, it's called API Connect slash Data Power. Data Power is basically the the runtime gateway okay. component of it. Um, and yeah, it, the, um, a new version of it, version ten, got released in June, and um, the GraphQL support basically made it into that version. So that's available. Um, so so you can look at it. I, nice. I I don't know exactly if there's a if there's a specific URL or something to share, but um, I think if if you Google it, you you, you can find it. Yeah, I'll I'll share that in um, in the show notes for sure. Nice. And yep. Rusty Dev eighteen uh, shared in chat that uh, you used a, a random query generator to write yeah. paper, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, I was almost thinking not only could this be to kind of a stress test an API, but mm -hmm. it could also be used in some ways for like even documentation and seeing like what kind of things are possible with an API. Um, it's a, it's definitely a yeah. great tool that I want to look into more. Um, Cause I, as we said earlier, like yeah, yeah. a public API gets a variety of queries that sometimes you didn't even think about. Um, so mm -hmm. this could be a really useful tool for people wanting to just run a almost kind of a fuzzer on their uh, yeah. GraphQL API, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, we 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 think so too, and um, we open sourced it, and um, so so we basically wrote it for for this paper, and we open sourced it recently, and it, I mean, it seems to have gotten some attention, which is really nice. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's there's some challenges in randomly generating the queries. I mean, to get them syntactically right from a schema that's not so much of a challenge imagine you're doing a query to github's graphql api right and you're going for like the root field being repository right and then you have to provide the owner and the name so already oh, there yeah. it's a little bit challenging because you have yeah. two arguments and actually the values of these arguments have to you know they align. depend on one another yeah. they have to align right and then maybe if you go, if you nest down, right, and then within that repository, if, if you want to go for stuff, then again, maybe, you know, the argument values that you want to choose depend on the previous selections. Ah, right. And so so the way that we built this random query generator is that you can basically, you give it, or you implement provider functions, which are specific for an API. 
and they are responsible for for giving you argument values and basically whenever such a provider function is run it um, it receives as as input all the argument values that have already been chosen so right so you may initially you may choose the owner of a repository to be um, uh, facebook right and then the second time a provider is called it's for the name of the um, repository and then that provider function already knows oh actually i already selected the owner to be facebook so now maybe i want to select the name to be react because you know react is an open source library by facebook um, and so that works but it means that you have to basically you have to implement these provider functions to um, adhere to these logical dependencies between argument values that makes so much sense. I didn't think about that. That's true. That's, you can't just generate random strings or random ints. No, unfortunately not. Sense. Yeah. <laughs> and, and trust me, I tried that. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I produced a lot of, um, of trash. <laughs> so that was you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't execute them. I, uh, <laughs> um, that's awesome. Um, I mean, Thank you so much for coming on. I think it's been an hour and 10. Sure. It's getting late in Germany. Um, do you want to yep. uh, plug anything else? We're going to have the IBM Connect uh, Data Power link in the show notes. Yeah. Anything sure. else? Yeah, um, sure. There's there's an open source library that we also produce. It's called Open API to GraphQL. Um, I know we, we thought we might want to talk about it. Um, it's um, I think you mentioned the paper before. Basically, that was the first thing that we did. Um, we basically looked into, I mean, I, I before I did GraphQL research, I looked into REST APIs, right? And so I spent a few years basically trying to convince people and IBM customers, you know, oh, you should have REST APIs. And then you go to GraphQL and you basically have to start from zero, right? Because <laughs> some of these people are just like, hey, you just told me to build a REST API and now you want me to go to GraphQL? You must be crazy. <laughs> and so we thought, can we, automate that transition somehow, right? And I think that's really a little bit a researchy project because I think if you want to build a really good GraphQL API, you should sit down and design and implement a really good GraphQL API. Just exposing a REST API as GraphQL often is not the perfect way forward. But I think that project you know that we have been evolving um, ever since um, Open API to GraphQL, it still has it still has its place, I think, because it basically, if you have a REST API and you have a Swagger or an Open API 3 documentation for it, right, then you can basically, in like in like seconds, you can have a GraphQL server sitting in front of it. And it's just great to get like a feel for how would a GraphQL API with my yeah. real data look like, right? Even if, if it's not really optimized in its execution, um, it's still, it, it still gives you, you know, the sense and maybe it sparks the interest for you to, to also consider using GraphQL in the future. And, and there's, a, there's a, a lot of great contributors um, out there who have, you know, um, gave us PRs and, and, and opened issues and, and it has evolved quite a bit and um, is doing really well at the moment. So that's definitely something that if, you know, if somebody may be uh, listening um, or watching is still very new to GraphQL, but has some background in with REST APIs, then maybe that's something for them um, to, to try things out with, without having to spend too much effort. And I can, of course, provide you a link as well um, if you want to put it into the show notes. Yep, I just put it in the chat as well. Um, it, it's, it looks like a, a great library. And I love the way you use the Open API links to express uh, relationships between types as well. Uh, it's awesome. And I think if people want to... Um, even if people are like beginning a GraphQL schema and they don't want to build the entire thing in like one, one go, one go yeah. um, you can you could use that kind of as a bridge, right? Like implement by hand the part you're confident in, and then yep. use yeah. Open API to GraphQL yeah. to kind of bridge to the yeah. the rest. I mean, the one thing it can give you is you can actually run it as a CLI, and it can you ingest the Open API, and you can actually print out the schema. So it could just basically, it could give you like your your very first version of your schema, right? And then you may choose to implement resolver functions for some of these fields or for some, you know, that, that are in that schema and basically evolve it um, over time 
Um, but but at least you're not starting from from zero, right? You already get some kind of a view of of your data, uh, and I think that that could be helpful. That's true. That's great, um, Tony. Anything on your mind? Oh man, a couple of things, but probably very uh, unique to our situation, and probably not super interesting to everyone else. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I just want to say it's been great talking to you. Thanks for taking the time and and staying up uh, late. Maybe hopefully uh, not too late. Um, no, 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 don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. This has been really cool to, to dig it. So I don't think it's every day you get to talk to like uh, one of the authors of a paper that you've written, you know, uh, and anticipate it. So a uh, very cool experience. Thank you very much for, for having me. I really appreciate it. And I think you have a great format here. So I'm going to be um, probably listening to some of the um, future episodes. I, I like the podcast format. Awesome. I go run from time to time, you know, that's, that's, that's perfect, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. And hope we hope to have you back, um, talk about some of that stuff more in depth. I think we could talk for hours about all the, the little details. So, yeah, thank you so much again, Eric. Uh, for, as far, for Tony and I, we'll be back next Tuesday. I don't think we have a guest confirmed just yet. Um, we have the, so yeah, we have the podcast now. That's on all the platform. We have our YouTube uh, for the videos. What else? I think that's pretty much it. Of course the twitch the twitch yes here we are <laughs> <laughs> can't forget that yep uh that's pretty much it that was really fun um cool thank you very much we'll thank see you later everyone pleasure talking to you guys see you